Okay, good morning. Thanks for coming to Barrams and Bitcoin. Thank you, Ragnar, for inviting me. I'm just going to call this the keynote. I don't think it is, but I'll just call it that. Yeah, okay, great. You guys can hear me? Yeah. All right, my name is Dominica Yowles, at least for this speech it is, at least for today it is. And if you don't use my preferred pronouns, at least during this speech, though, whoever this journalist is will call you at your construction job and get you fired. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that 3D printed guns are, you know, actually originated by a trans uh, woman, and it, it's true. Like, so we were diverse from our origins. I think it's worth pointing out. Today's speech is called Death Athletic. It's uh, something inspired by, okay, well, I'll talk about it in a second. I should, like, get the house cleaning out of the way. This talk is brought to you by DefCAD.com. I never do a good job of, like, explaining kind of who we are and what we're about, but um, Defense Distributed and... Our proud trans company in Austin, Texas, uh, also runs DefCAD.com, which is like uh, the world's largest repository of 3D gun CAD data. But I should also point out, if you're a creator, or you know, maybe I should even poll the audience, uh, anybody here interested in 3D gun printing, or have you 3D gun printed? Way more than I thought, actually. So if you're interested in that activity, it's not just like, uh, hey, we want you to download our stuff. It's we actually have a, a partnership program, and we invite you to participate. We are the only platform currently in the space that actually pays creators uh, for their work and uh, for the value derived from that work based on the market principle that the government has afforded us, uh, which we may speak about today. So get paid at defcad.com. All right. Uh, so I've got an outline here. We're going to go in three parts. I should probably start my timer just to make sure I actually don't blow through your, uh, your slot for me, Ragnar. Well, yeah, plenty of time. You think so? Yeah. I would use it maybe, but do we want to do questions? Does anyone want to do questions? I would take any question. Okay, so I'm just going to start this timer. <clears throat> All right, my outline then is um, basically I'm going to try to go three parts here. So death athletic is a concept I've been, uh, I don't know, mulling around for a bit. I borrowed from Slaughter Dyke's like anthropology of the acrobat. But I'm going to try to make it relatable, and I was told last time that my speech uh, last year was not very practical, so this is um, going to be like a practical speech, or at least the most practical speech I'm capable of giving. Um, so I hope to talk technique at the very end, and then maybe we can discuss even with the Q&A. This is perfect. This is like a beautiful, okay, so uh, theme, theme, uh, Ernst Younger, show me your relationship with pain, I'll show you who you are. You know, there are some people who believe that, like the hedonic principle uh, is that, well, we should only really pursue pleasure, we should only really pursue those things that, um, maximally benefit us and trade-offs and things, but I think, um, like the ancients and some of the, the moderns noted, including Nietzsche, there's an interest in pain, there's an interest in, um, let's say, men carrying burdens, and we recognize that maybe even this is important, um, that we subject ourselves to certain hardships. Uh, and so in that spirit, then, um, that men were meant to carry burdens, I'd like to contemplate maybe like Western thoughts, um, deepest contemplation of this, and I say deep in, a, in like the Nietzschean sense, like maybe pain doesn't make you better, like this speech isn't about like a improvement, like I don't think pain uh, makes you a better person, but maybe it deepens you. And so in that spirit, let's continue. Uh, just for the receipts, this is my old defunct Twitter bio before I was completely eradicated from social life, and uh, you know, my final bio there is Death Athletic. It's not my favorite bio, I like the second segue man of the apocalypse, but this is actually the thing I was like contemplating, my memento mori. Uh, before I was, in fact, um, removed a second time from the social. And uh, so, like I say, this is, uh, this is 2018, I think, the last time I updated that Twitter bio. And this is what I was thinking about when I was, in fact, uh, removed. And I include this not just for the receipts, but to say, like, look, even I sometimes will, I don't know, disenchant myself. And, and I want to teach about, like, some of the things I was actually thinking about, some of the things that actually, like, uh, inform, like, I don't know, our artistic passions or our motivation as a company, why we why we do what we do. Moving forward, euthanasia. Euthanasia, a Greek word. Uh, the Greeks were concerned with the art of the beautiful death. I mean, that's my understanding of the word. Beautiful death. Of course, we mean it in a, in a different way since the progressive revolution, but forget about you know, your installed or received wisdom about that word. Uh, euthanasia is about death performance, you could say. It's, uh, an obsession of the Greeks uh, to die in a beautiful way or like you, you can recontextualize it like with the Japanese or something, you know, the art of seppuku. And um, this, these have been cultural concerns for some time. And of course, there's something forgotten in a modern context. But uh, Sloterdijk would say in his, I mentioned earlier, his anthropology of ascesis and acrobatics. Sloterdijk would say that 
uh, euthanasia is the secret center of what he calls humanity's uh, uh, acrobatic revolution. And so we want, I want to begin with death performance, the art of the beautiful death. The first time I think um, I realized I had died, or like died socially, um, lost all my relationships or something, was uh, when, I, when I published Liberator, the first 3D printed gun. You guys can hear me still? Yeah. Okay, great, cool. So, what's that? Okay, great, thank you, thank you. How is this? Thank you guys. Okay, so the first time I think I died or realized I was, was dead or something, in a sense, was with Liberator. And uh, I, I didn't anticipate, I didn't know what would happen. Um, I had read what I thought was some cool shit when I was in school, like um, Robespierre's Virtue and Terror, you know, with, uh, I think I was introduced to that by Zizek, and this idea that like, well, we can include the threat of our death or at least our indifference to it as like a historical accident, as a way of proving that we're like committed to our, our projects or something. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm dead. Or like when the New York Times journalist asks, well, what if someone prints your gun out and shoots you, Cody? Like this is the most common thing that the libs still ask, 3D gun printers. And when you go, meaningfully, like you sniff and you say, hey, you know, maybe it'll happen. Ooh, that like really, that's some like crazy shit that they don't like to hear, you know? It's, you, you're confessing this indifference to your death, you know? So I had had this kind of intuition already with Liberator. Um, what I didn't expect was, I mean, I don't know, I had, I had read some of like Bojard's fatal strategies too. Like I knew death was somehow a part of it and like this was a limited experience in culture and maybe not to get too deep into this, but when Liberator actually happened, I was like, oh wow. Um, you know, I was told by my first attorney that like, dude, your life is over, this is a State Department enforcement action, like you'll be lucky if you don't get like 10 years in prison. And I was like, oh wow, this is, I'm like, I'm really done. And, like, a, you know, assuming some of these things, even in gray areas of the law, um, is, is to go beyond, you know, the, the pale and to, and to risk something like a social or a physical death. Um, and I, I was bitter, not bitter, but I was like, I was upset at having not really understood that, but how can you understand these kinds of things? How can you be prepared for that? So. Uh, the reason I've now come to this slide is the second time I thought I would die, somehow I like clawed my way back from the whole Liberator experience and like, um, you know, mounted an opposition, built a, a new company with Defense Distributed to, to make the Ghost Gunner, to have enough money to sue the State Department. It's a, it's a whole roundabout thing, but we'll get to it and we'll get to why. Uh, and I was like, uh, I learned just by happenstance, it was like March of 2018, I learned I was going to somehow impossibly like beat the federal government in this contest about the First Amendment and 3D files. Am I getting too quiet again? Okay, perfect. And so when I had learned that, uh, I was like, well, I'm certainly not gonna survive this victory. I didn't survive the last one. And knowing that my death would like, you know, this social death or this other, this real thing was going to happen and I was probably gonna ruin my life again for, you know, who knows. Uh, I was like, well, what's a, what's a secessionary statement? What's a way to be known? What's a way to bury the name of God and like confess, like I, you know, I nevertheless, yes, I choose this death. And so I, you know, I, I, had, uh, I chose to resurrect this, like, this symbol from Goliad. This is the severed arm of, of Philip Demet's flag that flew at uh, La Bahia in Goliad of the Texas Revolution. Um, long disused and not very familiar, even to Texans, although you know, some Texans know it now. But, uh, and I, I guess the intuition there from like, the artistic passion is like, uh, well, we had done something similar with the flag of, of Gonzalez, if you know the come and take it flag, the cannon. And Gonzalez, of course, features in the Texas Revolution as well. And so it was like dwelling on this idea of, uh, of Texan independence and secessionary gestures. What's another gesture? What's a way to show that we're intentional in a way that can be known uh, beyond just the accidents of, of my stupid company and my own you know, pointless death or something? What's a message that can kind of carry forward symbolically from that moment? Uh, so we chose, I chose the, the severed arm of Goliath. This is like the strongest statement of Texan independence. And maybe it's not worth belaboring, but since I have a little extra time, uh, you, can, you can go back and see that Dimit and the boys at La Bahia were actually the first people to assert Texan independence in the revolution. Um, beforehand, it was this like, the, like all revolutions go, well, actually we're committed as Texans to the Constitution of 1824 of Mexico. And so you see we're committed Republicans and you know, like actually this isn't a revolution at all and we're not looking for independence. But the boys at La Bahia were like, you know what, mm, white jihad. And uh, that's where this flag erupts, you know. And uh, in itself, Goliad, and I, I don't want to go too deep into this, but Goliad is, is a fun word. So I had tried to adopt that word as well and its significance because Goliad is an anagram. Uh, and in, in the work of Baudrillard, he says you should always bury the name of God in these like secessionary gestures. And so I'll tell you, at least looking backward, that anagram was uh, an anagram for Hidalgo. So like the, the, the settlement before Texan independence was of course a Mexican one and Hidalgo was, 
one of the greatest figures of Mexican independence and secession. And so it seemed to me that Goliad uh, was this specifically Texan situated way of telescoping secessionary gesture, okay? It was Mexican independence, it's Texan independence, now with 3D printed guns, what are we saying? Some kind of weird cypherpunk 3D printed gun independence? I don't know, you figure it out, I'll be dead. <laughs> so moving forward, you know, what a joy to be hidden in this way. What a disaster not to be found, but I believe someone found me, here he is, you know? And uh, Jay Sark had his own motives, his own reasons, and I can't know them, I didn't know him well personally, but I think it's worth pointing out that the FGC Marks one and two include the severed arm of Goliath. It was like J. Sark understood the secessionary gesture and he shared the same impulse to say the same thing. At least there's a relationship here. Am I too quiet? No. Okay, I'm a little obsessed with the idea now. So, um, so look, a cynic could say um, that, you know, knowing what happened to J. Sark, a cynic could say that J. Sark adopted our kind of praxis or this. Sim this you know, these symbols as like his own funeral ideology or something, or like the intelligence agencies, probably one of you, you know, represents them here today. You know, you may think this is a representation of like the strange new, you know, the strains of Euro Kurdistan, like the radicalism, like invading Europe or something. But we, I would say we the living, we Americans understand something better because Jay Stark left us more clues than just his use uh, of the arm. You see live free or die. And then you see his name there, Jay Stark. What is it? 1806, is that what that says? 1809. Uh, I can't actually read, by the way. It's just like a whole, it's a whole thing. Uh, so this is, this is General John Stark's letter uh, to the boys at Bennington, and, and Jay Stark chose to ad adopt this kind of pseudonym of this Revolutionary War veteran, um, writing at the end of his life uh, to those who would have a reunion celebrating uh, the events of Bennington, um, saying that he couldn't join them. You know, and he regretted it, but instilling them and, and leaving them with this famous postscript, this live free or die motto, which became the motto of the state of New Hampshire, and of course has been used in the French Revolution and, and many other revolutions all over the world ever since. Live free or die, bold words. They seem heartily, healthily American words, and of course I think maybe they originate with Patrick Henry or the, you know, the Virginia delegation, the boys who wanted to reconstruct that militia uh, once the royal charter had been removed. But uh, the point of this slide and the point of my including it is like it's allows us to look at Jay Stark and give like a complete reading to his life, which wasn't just like this was a guy who wanted to say some cool shit. Uh, this was a guy who understood that he was a part of our revolution and was a soldier of it with us, but somehow knew that he wouldn't join us in the reunion or wouldn't be able to, and in fact was predicting his own death. Um, I think that's a beautiful death performance. And somehow, even if unconsciously, you know, he knew it and was practicing, you know, my ostensible point here, some type of euthanasia. Um, this is meant to illustrate the tightrope walker from the spoke Zarathustra. Uh, Zarathustra, did I say it? Yeah, Zarathustra. So the tightrope walker in this, in this scene, um, you know, Jester, uh, Jester comes out during the performance and, and knocks him off his game. He loses his head, he loses the wire, and he falls to his death. Um, he doesn't immediately die, and Zarathustra the prophet is there by his like, mangled body, and he says, oh shit, I'm going to hell, you know, uh, I'm just going to die. Um, how pointless my life is, and Zarathustra says, well, not at all, you may danger your profession. And that's not nothing. Um, allow me to bury you, or, you know, choose to die by your vocation, essentially. This is the essence of, of that speech. And I would say then that I don't know how J. Stark lived, but I believe he died an American. And that's something I want to say about him here. He made danger his profession. And so J. Stark's maybe final symbolic, I don't know, presentation for us is this like Stark choice from the motto, right? Live free or die. Live free or fucking die, I believe, was J. Stark's turn on it. That's amazing. And in fact, quite an injunction with that uh, addition. So I, we might recognize, though, that, um, that death is almost a certainty for us, even not a choice. Freedom, as this other peak, seems quite, uh, quite less certain than death, probably. Um, is it even possible? Do you feel free? I, put, I should put like a Bane slide there. Um, so then I think the only question then is like how to venture this crossing because of course we know if we stay on the shore we, and don't engage in any kind of practice like we're surely headed for one of these results, this depressing result of death. How do we make this crossing to freedom? Uh, freedom Technology Conference, you know, like what are the metaphysics of this desire? Mm, let's examine. I would say um, 
we can reach the answer to this question uh, through just a brief detour, I promise, in the work of René Girard. And the final thing I'll say about secessionary gestures or this will toward freedom is that maybe conflict is okay. Maybe uh, the, the large moral disputes in our community about like documentation and uh, the severity of, the, of the, the contest is okay. Like it's, it's all right to begin with this understanding that I must change my life it's literally a crime that you don't test your files and like you are scum. Like, I think this is the right impulse and, and the right beginning, but I think there's metaphysics of these desires that are worth examining and I hope can be recorded here today, which will allow us or instruct us to perhaps make more productive use of our secessionary moral impulse. Okay, so this is Rene Girard. He's our little professor. He's our Virgil through section two mediation. Um, Rene Girard teaches us a number of things about desire. Uh, about our will, our metaphysical ambitions. Uh, the standard model, let's say, of like wanting to do something or reaching an objective is, is this direct, this linear one. Okay, I'm a creator. I want to make something really cool like the FGC9 because I've, like, I've, I've heard about it. I think that's really badass. Um, so we imagine this kind of direct relationship where I, I pursue that object. I'm a subject pursuing the object. But uh, Girard tells us, not so fast. In fact, um, we're not quite free really to desire anything or even imagine anything. We have to learn it like anything else. Uh, desire is imitative. Um, it's taught too. It's learned. We copy. And so all desires, even the simplest ones, but especially those great ones and passions, uh, we learn from a mediator. There he is. That's the holy peppy mediator. He lives in an inaccessible paradise to us. He, he looks down on us almost with contempt, you could say, but it's a benevolent contempt. Uh, and so we have a relationship uh, to the mediator uh, in the way that we pursue our, our, our stated or intended object. Um, and of course, this is not, uh, this should not be like a surprise. Uh, Spangler reminds us, I just had to throw some right wingers in there, but not a right wing conference. Spangler reminds us that um, it's always this way in history. Like Napoleon thought of himself as akin to like Charlemagne, or, you know, Petrarch thought of himself as Cicero and Cecil of Rhodes. Uh, had a custom, you know, a volume of the Caesars made, and he thought of himself as like Emperor Hadrian or something. You know, the organizer of British South Africa. Check it out. So, uh, in the example of, let's say, back to J. Stark and the, F the FGC9, his desire, um, his stated purpose, and his accomplishment was, let's say, perfecting the promise of 3D printed guns or, or the first fulfillment of the promise of 3D printed guns. As you may remember in the documentation of the FGC9, um, it is said, Liberator is proof of concept, FGC is proof of carbine. Uh, a, a, beautiful, a beautiful restatement of, of his purpose. And of course, he, he goes on to some other links. But um, his ability to, to fulfill that promise uh, is by recognizing the promise that was already outlined for him by the work of Defense Distributed. You could say his work was mediated by Defense Distributed. And it was so uh, by following this, um, I don't know, this, this understanding of the intended concept of Liberator and, and making that real in his mind that he accomplished FGC9 in the terms that he did. Um, Girard says like there are heroes of external mediation. Um, it doesn't really matter what external mediation is. I should probably speed it up, but it's about your distance to the mediator. External mediation is, hey, I'm Don Quixote. I recognize I want to be like Amadis. You know, I, I know who I'm copying. I'm telling you who I'm copying. Jay Stark says, uh, Defense Distributed tried to, to do this thing with Liberator. I'm trying to do the same thing. Um, so he knew what he was doing. He told you why. This is external mediation. But Girard tells us that there are also, as there are heroes of external mediation, there are victims of internal mediation. Um, for this example, I'd like to illustrate a, a victim of, of internal mediation. Uh, fatherly instruction, remember. Uh, the example is Atlas Arms, and maybe not many people have heard of Atlas Arms. That's okay, you probably will. But the point is, Atlas Arms is also uh, a company, an organization, and a group of people mediated by the experience and the example of Defense Distributed, and ostensibly trying to accomplish a similar goal, which is something like GunCAD online or... Uh, in their case, uh, technical data for ammunition and, and other related projects, which is, you know, all in the same spirit, open source, you know, defeat, like uh, upset the institutions, you name it. And how do they do this? They organize their, well, look, there are obvious, like, immediate uh, similarities. And, of course, Gerard tells us that, like, in the examples of mediation, the external imitations can be, like, startling. And so I'm not, I'm not saying this is that startling, but Atlas Arms chooses to be, like, an alliterative, company, right? AA, DD, uh, they're a nonprofit. They use the, their research from their work to commercially fund additional research and they hope to fight the ATF. Like there's a lot of similarities to what the work of Defense Distributed is. Not a surprise, directly mediated, no big deal. But 
Girard says in uh, the victims uh, of internal mediation, um, they actually lose the focus of the subject, um, of the, I mean, I'm sorry, of the object that they're pursuing, and um, they, they, let's say they get lost, okay? I'll move on. Uh, an example of this kind of, this being lost in this forest is after a while, let's say if four or five years go by, you're not accomplishing like the purpose of your project, you begin to interpret your mediator as like a rival who's actually trying to thwart you or some kind of evil god who is like actually now preventing you uh, from accomplishing your goal. And so like this is an example tweet just from I think last month where, okay, here's Austin Jones to, to Zero Hedge, right? There's a couple of things we can unpack here, but like, you know, I swear to God, Zero Hedge, if you ever do a story about us here at Atlas Arms, that shit, Cody Wilson, didn't have a goddamn thing to do with it. And uh, you know what? Stop giving credit to politicians and actors. So it goes a, a statement beyond. He's also saying, you know, Cody Wilson defends the tribute. They don't even do anything, you know? Uh, and so Gerard is saying a couple of things which I think can be like exemplified in this tweet, which are, um, well, well, number one, like Austin is kind of living on his inheritance already. He's talking to Zero Hedge about an article about his work, which by the way, doesn't exist yet, you know? So he's already like taking out lines of credit on things like he hasn't done because he kind of lives in this like diverted, like deviated transcendency where it's like, well, he's obviously more pure and more earnest in his attempts to accomplish the purposes of something like Defense Distributed. And Defense Distributed itself is like this perverted fallen thing, which like actually isn't even doing that anymore. Uh, and then finally, uh, to the point where Defense Distributed is actually wholly just pretending and, and an actor, and in fact, like not just an encumbrance to him, Austin Jones, or the Atlas Arms, but to everyone in the space, you see. So um, there's this kind of negative divinity given to the, uh, to the mediator in, in Girard, where actually like we are, you know, the devil. Uh, and so Girard points out, and I, I swear to God we'll get out of this section, but uh, he points out that like, in fact, as the years go on, and you can look at the history of Atlas Arms, it's kind of like this four or five year, you know, project of self-display where nothing really gets published or nothing actually gets commercially developed, but like Atlas Arms becomes better and better at like being like a better version of defense distributed, at least in terms of presentation, you know, and purpose and purity and, you know, what a joy it is to read a live blog about how like how pure a company is in, a, in, a, in an industry of fakes and everything. Um, amazing. Girard's saying like with that golden arrow there, what a victim of internal mediation is doing is often just trying to uh, copy the desires of the mediator, not really trying to accomplish the intended or stated object. Of, the, of that desire. Um, why do I bring all this up? Well, it's because like, I think this is the source of like ressentiment, you know, like Scheller's modern feelings in our community because it's easy to inhabit a certain persona of the 3D gun printer or like, you know, the freedom technology rebel or advocate, Bitcoin privacy extremist, these kinds of things. It's, it's easy to like inhabit that persona and then somehow purity spiral and pretend that actually, you know, like you have a real metaphysical autonomy, which isn't mediated by anyone or influenced by anyone. And actually like you are the literal pope of some kind of like particular cypherpunk ideology. I'm sorry that I keep looking at you, man. Uh, is this all right with you? Like I'm just, now I've pointed you out, I'm sorry. But I, I feel like you're inspiring my, uh, you know, I feel like we're having a conversation. So anyway, so like I'm, I'm speaking to you about like, I really want you to understand this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to call you out, man. Uh, so, look, uh, I'm saying a bunch of things here, okay? But basically, like, this, this idea of, like, metaphysical autonomy and, and Nietzschean confusion, you know, like, I think it's worth pointing this out. And, you know, maybe a way out of it can still be found by using the example of, of Atlas Arms. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, so let's use that example. Um, this deviated transcendency, this like spoliation, this like encountering of, of impotent hatred and rage at like your inability to accomplish your stated purpose while you're being, you know, mediated by something like Defense Distributed leads to like these strange episodes of stolen valor. And I mean this very dearly because of course, remember the purpose of our speech is the death athletic and some type of euthanasia and hazarding your life, you know, like actually something deeper and symbolic. Um, these episodes become like, um, really meaningful. So like in an example of a, a, a newsletter update that Atlas Arms sends to donors, uh, the most recent one, in fact, in January, he says, well, look, you know, uh, I've got, you know, an open source manual I'm writing and it's got everything in it. Okay. It's going to have like all the technical data and instructions and like all the stuff. It's like really great, but you know, I'm sorry, I can't share it with you uh, because we're a unique target in the space. In fact, even more so than our 3D printed brothers, and if you know anything about 3D printed guns, it, it, the, the files are actually still claimed to be regulated by the feds. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, it's true that it is a crime actually to share 3D printed gun files on the internet uh, in certain ways. And so Austin's saying, 
you know, we're even more uh, of a target than, than our brothers in 3D printing are. Like, I know you probably see their files out there and get it, but like, listen, like, this is some toxic stuff here. Like, this is very dangerous what we're doing. We're up on the wire, right? We're, we're tightrope walking. And like, I, we're going to share the manual with you, I, I promise. But look, just give me a minute. Um, you know, federal and state laws. The problem here is that like, this is a lie. Uh, this is not true. Uh, 734.7c EAR says like the only files that can't be shared on the internet or publicly disclosed uh, to the public domain are, are software and technical data for firearms, firearm frames and receivers. Okay, so I've got good news, Atlas Arms. We fought your battle for you, buddy. And uh, you know, we won. And you could share your stuff today. You could share your stuff tomorrow. But we, we get the, the sense, right, that uh, there's a certain fear then um, from Atlas Arms about, I don't, I don't know, like objective mediocrity or, or like whatever. Um, we, we know that like it's, it's better to have this excuse um, that someone is preventing you from, from publishing. I'm preventing you from publishing. But just remember, I'm the actor, I'm the politician. Uh, so, you know, I won't mention another episode of Stolen Valor. It doesn't matter. At least Austin can kind of point us out of the way. Uh, the way of the, the sand trap. We're stuck in some quicksand here when we're a victim of internal mediation. Uh, Girard says, you know, we can make men our gods uh, or we can make God our god, essentially. This is one of the easiest ways out of the, the mediation trap. We can actually choose a real divine mediator or, uh, you know, we can kind of pretend that men are our gods and, and suffer the consequences. And so um, I think this is the perfect dilemma represented by the self-display of Atlas Arms, where it's like it's both simultaneously like this Randian project about heroes and, you know, like intense individualism and nostalgia for the desert and all this stuff, which, by the way, usually conceals like a, a morbid concern for the other. Uh, and two, like he's, a, you know, like a, a professed Christian. And I think let's choose the Christianity on this one and kind of forget the Randian thing. Uh, I think the Christian thing, God the architect, helps you more. Uh, finally, then, let's get to technique. Why did I go through that entire episode with you? It's because I think if we have a divine mediator and we're contemplating the deepest questions of pain, like death and death performance, uh, we have a combination required now to like really perform. And it's okay that like the 3D printed gun space has become like, you know, it's manifold, just like in Bitcoin. There are many lifestyle brands and there are many people that trade on just kind of the aesthetics and like the Uber or whatever, that's great. But I think there's still a higher practice. I think there's still something that can really be done and really wow people. And I think it's about involving your death and the concepts that I'm talking about here today. Jay Stark is of course, an ultimate example, let's not forget Yoshitomo Amura, who paid the price too. Uh, anyway, using the example of Christianity then and divine mediation, we can begin with, uh, you know, the most Christian Christian himself, Christ crucified. What is the passion about? Well, a lot of things, depending upon your, you know, your opinion. But what's most interesting to me for the purpose of death athletics and explaining this agonist ethos to you, which I swear to God I'm going to do, we use... Uh, the account in John 19.30. So like in Luke and Matthew, Christ is on the cross. Luke and Mark, Christ is on the cross. He, cr he cries out, he dies. And Matthew, I think he says, you know, Father, I give up my, my spirit to you. This is almost the statement that we're looking for. But in John, the addition is very interesting. In John, he says, tetelestea, or in Latin, consummatum est. As we know it in English, Christ says, it is finished. And just that addition takes... Christ crucified from like a chance victim of Judeo-Roman politics, right? Like twice humiliated, given like the worst state punishment possible and just made like a, a complete, um, you know, a complete humiliated sacrifice. Just that addition, it is finished, consummatum est, says, right? It's a superordination um, of the compulsory. It says, ah, of course, this, according to my plan, according to like my father's plan, this is all foreseen and like we've, we've done it. It's an athletic statement. Um, John, according to Sloterdijk, has athleticized the passion. He said uh, essentially something like mission accomplished. That statement, that subordination of the circumstances literally changes <laughs> history and reorganizes uh, you know, the, the Western narrative. Okay, this is one of the greatest statements possible. And how did he do it from a position of ultimate weakness and humiliation? This is the, the core of the death athletic, the core of the death performance. Christian death athletics um, reaches maybe its, most, its, its deepest clarity in Tertullian of Carthage. Latin Christianity begins in Africa, by the way. We was Christians. And uh, so Tertullian says uh, to those martyrs or to those suffering under like I think Severus or something you know like the, the the standard Christians thrown to the, to the lions and all this he writes in these letters he's like look your prison is a training ground okay and if these slaves and these gladiators are going to compete for these perishable crowns 
how much more should your performance be when you know you're competing uh, for an eternal one? And this pep talk, you could call it, is, is so deep and, and why that I think it's worth mentioning uh, in the context of deaf athletics. It, it is the, the ultimate statement of performance in the face of not just the impossible, but like the surely, uh, the surely terminal. Uh, I don't have to just keep this religious, you know, thanks to Austin Jones for giving us the inspiration, but of course the other primal death scene in old Europe is the death of Socrates. It's the same thing here. Why is this such a, a momentous occasion in all of thought, uh, in all of philosophy? It's because essentially the old man, through his wisdom, uses his ability to appropriate this compulsory sentence, which is unjust and everyone's weeping about, and he uses it and cooperates to the, with the authorities to such a degree that it's like he organized the passion play himself. In, in, the, in the dialogue Crito, he says, I hear the voice of the gods, the laws are talking to me, I know what I must do, I have to still follow this path. It's the same thing. It's this death athletic ethos. He has used his skill uh, to subordinate the voluntary over the compulsory. This is incredible stuff, incredible technique. And so now we see the sophistication of the Yes Chad meme <laughs> at a deeper level. What does the yes chad meme mean? Is it just negation? Is it just this kind of happy circumstance? No, I think there's like a, a, a much deeper thing here. I think it's about the subordination of the voluntary over the compulsory or the accidental. Uh, and so then a primary technique of defense distributed, politicians, performers, anonymous, insert whatever authority you want. The ATF, New Jersey, State Department, I do not care. I do not care what arbitrary thing, what rule, what law, what guidance, or in the ATF's case, as we've learned, what secret guidance they will deploy. We say yes. <laughs> we say of course. It's all going according to our plan. Now, this is uh, maybe the most uh, demonstrable recently from us in the example of the 0% receiver. It was most important in that episode for old man Biden to say, I've solved the ghost gun problem. I've got this new rule, you can't even make a gun from a kit at home anymore. Take that, you incels. And so what do we say? <laughs> we say, of course, exactly, the fulfillment of the Ghost Gunner project. We've been working at this for years. I can't believe the fools did it. The age of 0% has begun. All right, this is the superordination of the voluntary over the compulsory. It is the use of ability to integrate uh, the compulsory. Okay? Think about it. This is the core of the death athletic ethos. And I'm to the point of death, by the way, I, I simply mean, I'll, I'll explain that. Okay, we're back to Jay Stark's thing now, right? Now we're thinking about like taking the venture. All right, what does it mean? It means we're pursuing this thing which we know is absurd, okay? I'm not saying freedom's not worth pursuing, but I am saying you probably won't see the other shore, but you will suspend the tragedy in the beauty of the attempt. The salto mortale is about defying death directing the gaze, and I have seen, in our example alone, the, sus like the total suspension of belief, even on the part of this authority. They are stunned. Even a year ago, the State Department was stunned. They cannot believe what is happening. They feel like they are trapped in this prison with us. Do you understand? It is this will, it is this agonal ethos, which is the difference maker, and I think can be taught by the example of 3D printed guns. I think it's worth speaking about here today. I think it honors the death of Jay Stark. I think it's something very core, and so in the interest of disclosure, because I'm always considered to be so secretive, uh, here's my roadmap, okay? Here's my roadmap. I hope to get any of this done in 22. I know I won't, because I've been working on that top one for 10 fucking years, okay? All that means is recognizing that 3D files are protected by the First Amendment. Is that a meaningful thing to do, Cody? Didn't last year you tell us that the pursuit of the political is like super gay or something? Uh, that's not the point. I'm teaching you the agonal ethos. I know it's strictly speaking absurd and impossible to get a court or the, the Supreme Court or the federal government to recognize that the First Amendment protects 3D printed gun files. What I'm saying is making that attempt, making that improbable thing, con like uh, accidentally conquering that is such a startling, disturbing thing for the orders that be that it literally scrambles you know, the, the coordinates of the possible worse than like super AI from Google or something, okay? It's worth doing for that for that reason alone, and the pursuit of it literally suspends the tragedy uh, which is otherwise happening. Just in the shadow cone of this large contest we've had with the State Department, the Commerce Department pursuing this First Amendment recognition of our files, we have allowed, or let's say, forestalled that authority's other pretenses. There's, there we're just all bound up in the shadow cone of this event, and so our entire culture has grown up in the shadow of this stupid high-wire performance 
uh, with a 3D printed gun First Amendment conversation. It's worth doing for that reason alone. Uh, and so uh, I've already mentioned the 0% thing. I think it's worth doing. Why? Because there's a similar contest there about the nature of like, what is a gun? What is it, even the literal definition of a gun? If I'm allowed the chance to monkey around with that, I don't think authorities even prepare for the consequences. I think it's worth pursuing for that reason. Uh, and then finally, California. They're always doing such cool things in California. What a great <laughs> laboratory for democracy. Um, and especially regulations of gun parts. And so the, a new regime begins in California this summer for precursor parts uh, and other things. And I'm, I'm told that they plan to ban our machine, the Ghost Gunner, in January. Amazing. I would love to be the first person to have the standing to argue about the right to make guns and gun parts. What the hell can happen in that 10-year conference? But like, the point is, I n almost know that I can't accomplish any of these things. Who can even expect to participate in a 10-year federal battle? I mean, I've literally died almost twice on the way. You know, so I, ex I, I pursue these things in the Nietzschean, in the Jungarian sense. I pursue these things even though I know I will likely perish in the attempt. I think that's the example of Jay Stark. I think that's the example of the Death Athletic. But I swear to God, dude, if I get that First Amendment win, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to get on Twitter or like email Zero Hedge or whatever and bitch about like how hard it is and nobody recognizes my shit. I'm going to take a fucking bow and I'm going to say, well, of course, we always knew it was going to happen. It was according to our plan for our kind. This is nothing. Thank you.